Hi, welcome to the Social Media Church Podcast. I am Neil Smith, your host, and Jay Cranda is not with me in this special edition episode, but I am joined by Dr. Steve Gershevich of Key Ministry. Steve, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Nils. It's quite an honor to have an opportunity to be part of this podcast. Well, very good. So let's let's jump right in. Uh, Steve, if you could share, you, you lead uh, the Ministry of Key Ministry, and you're also a doctor. And so can you talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and, and, and a little bit about key ministry? Well, it's interesting, Nils, because I didn't ever envision there being a place for um, a physician who specializes in child and adolescent psychiatry and ministry. But, you know, as God would orchestrate circumstances, about 15 to 20 years ago, I was on the elder board of our local church. And we had a number of families who had been very dedicated and committed families in the church who did the Eastern European adoption thing after the fall of the Iron Curtain and brought back some kids from Russia and Bulgaria who had some very complex emotional, behavioral, and developmental problems. And some of the staff from our church um, found that they needed to develop some strategies and some resources to help to keep these families engaged because the struggles that the kids were having were becoming a significant impediment to the families being able to do church. So I'm on the elder board at that time, and they're talking about some of the work that they're doing with the families who had adopted. And in the meantime, I probably had the second largest outpatient clinic in our area. And in an informal way, over the next few months, listening to what they were talking about, I wondered if this is a problem for the kinds of families that we would serve. Families who have kids who are struggling with issues with like anxiety, mood problems, kids on the high end of the autism spectrum, kids with ADHD, problems like that. And I was floored by what I found out. And while I don't have formal statistics, my guess was that the kinds of families that we would see here are probably about as half as likely on a weekly basis to attend church compared to other families in our community who aren't dealing with these issues. So as God would orchestrate it, um, around that time, I got involved with a couple of research projects that became very popular and found myself having the opportunity to spend two to three days a week traveling the country just teaching other docs. Everywhere I went, I would mention something in the introduction about some of the work that our church was doing back here in Cleveland, and they got inundated with requests for help. So the key ministry came about then at the end of 2002. And our mission is to come alongside and help churches as they minister with families who have kids with mental illness, trauma, and developmental disabilities. So, and, and, and I know you don't have exact stats, but, but I feel like in a conversation before you've told me that maybe 10% of families uh, are impacted by disability or what, what, is there a general stat that you can share that would help church leaders understand how significant this is? Well, actually, one in five kids have a significant mental health issue or concern. And that by, you know, you know, by a vast margin, mental illness is the most common disabling condition that we see in kids and teens, not just here in the United States, but worldwide as well. Okay. So that um, one in nine school-age kids in the United States have gotten at least one prescription for ADHD medicine. Hmm. Anywhere from 8 to 12% of teens have a significant anxiety disorder, and fewer than one in five ever get any kind of treatment. We know that 13% of kids in the United States have a developmental disability, and that of the one in 68 kids who are diagnosed now with autism, the majority of them have normal to high intelligence. And those are kids who up to now haven't fit into the general paradigm of special needs ministry that um, has become more widespread in recent years and that many churches have um, sought to pursue. And so that there are some unique things about the population of kids that we see that doesn't really fit within some of the things that more traditionally churches have offered in terms of outreach and offered in terms of evangelism. Hmm. So what, what, what is it that, uh, that churches are missing? What, what is it that's creating that barrier from those families being a part of and participating, connecting in, in the local church? Well, 
I think that, I mean, there are a number of different obstacles, but I think that the two that are most relevant to our discussion is that a lot of the families that I would serve and the folks that we're trying to help churches serve, um, it's a problem because they're very socially isolated. When you have kids who have some of the conditions that we're talking about, you know, kids on the high end of the autism spectrum, kids with sensory issues, kids who have significant anxiety issues, um, kids with other developmental disabilities, they may not be involved in the full range of extracurricular activities, the youth sports, um, the, you know, the, the drama, the theater, the Boy Scouts, some of the other things that help families connect with one another and help them to be able to build a larger social network. Um, one of the problems is that when parents have kids like this, they can't just hire any 13-year-old down the block to be able to babysit. And so that they become socially isolated from other couples or other adults, say, in their neighborhood, in their workplace, in their community. And so that they don't have the relationships with the other people who are likely to invite them to church, and their kids may not have the friendships that get them invited to vacation Bible school, other types of special outreach events that churches have as a way of connecting with families. So that the folks that we know are a lot less likely to know someone who's connected with a church and to have a relationship with somebody who's going to go ahead and invite them in. The other issue is that our kids, and oftentimes their parents, because the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, struggle a lot with social communication. And, you know, you think about the typical church, and it's an intensely social place. And if you have a condition where you have a harder time being able to pick up, say, on someone's tone of voice, their voice inflection, their body language, their facial expressions, all the relationships that one has to navigate to be able to get connected to a church become a major challenge. The larger issue in terms of the social communication is that we see lots and lots of folks who struggle with anxiety. And an example I threw out when I was speaking at a conference last week is, let's say, and this would be a hypothetical situation, that you have single mom living down the street from your church with two kids, has a nine-year-old son who has ADHD and dyslexia, and a six-year-old daughter who has separation anxiety. Um, her nine-year-old son gets invited by one of his friends from school to come to VBS, has a great time, wants to come to church every week. If that mom has social anxiety and has panic attacks around crowds, think about every potential impediment that she would face and that that family would face getting connected with a church. How many people do you have to talk to the first day to be able simply to get registered? Um, how uncomfortable is a mom going to feel in that situation? What might she be afraid of um, having heard stories of other people who have attended church in the past? Are they going to ask me to stand up to be recognized? Am I going to have to talk? What if I get there and it's crowded and I, my heart starts racing and there's not an open seat somewhere at the end of an aisle or next to a door? You know, so a lot of things that we take for granted um, to folks who have you know, these conditions that we refer to as hidden disabilities, they can be an enormous impediment to connecting with a church and then staying involved with a church because of the things that we require of people from a social skill standpoint to be actively engaged and involved. Wow. That, I mean, that, that's a lot for, and as a church leader for the last 15 years or so, th those are things that I, I generally just haven't thought of. Um, and, and I think every church leader needs, needs to become more, more aware of. Um, can, can you share um, uh, about you, how you're using social media? We'll get to how churches can use social media uh, and, and how you're helping churches to use social media. But how, how are you as a ministry uh, who's ministering to churches or, or in general, just share, uh, you're doing some unique stuff with Key Ministry, how you're using social media uh, to both connect with churches and to connect with uh, families impacted by disability. Well, let me start by mentioning when I had my epiphany. And 
we were doing a study um, looking at treating kids who had problems with anxiety, um, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, separation anxiety. And my epiphany came one night when I was messing around on Facebook and saw that one of my kids who was engaged in a federally funded social anxiety study had 609 Facebook friends. And I was thinking, well, well how's this possible? And, and we started noticing a trend where we would have kids involved with um, this study who might send 13,000 texts in a month and had zero minutes of talk time. And it was such a typical pattern that we actually started using it clinically as one of the things that we would be asking about in terms of screening kits. Because we found that kids who had issues with anxiety, kids who had any kind of trouble with social communication, um, became intensely dependent upon electronic communication as a way of interacting with the world and were much more comfortable with using that medium. Now, applying that to key ministry, um, one of the thoughts that we had had with this, and part of what had originally drawn us to social media and to think about doing some things online, was that we needed, some, we needed a scalable way to be able to offer training to more and more churches. So that we started looking at various online platforms as a way of being able to reach and to train and to share our resources with more people on a limited budget when we were using people to train who weren't available to jump on a plane every weekend and where maybe we didn't have the money to be able to do that because as an organization, we've historically given away all of our training and all of our consultation, our resources. So we started there, but we latched onto the idea that online church might be a very unique way of helping to overcome the social isolation that a lot of these families deal with by creating a platform where local churches could put their services online and we would use targeted advertising with a Google grant um, using disability related keywords to try to reach families in those communities or within a certain radius of that church who were struggling with some of these disability related issues and to try to use technology as a way of helping those churches to be able to introduce themselves to the families that we care for, but to do it in a way in which the family being served has the opportunity to connect with the church in what is the optimal environment for that family. So that a lot of the kids and a lot of families we work with have issues with sensory processing bright lights, loud noise, crowds, smells can be a problem. So the church is making the introduction at the time that works best for the family, in the environment that works best for the family, with the parents having as much control as possible over the initial experience. Now, the other part of this that's really critical is that when we talk about looking at online church, we don't see this as being a substitute for bricks and mortar church. That it's a strategy for helping people to be able to form relationships with folks inside a local church who are positioned to ease the transition so that they might have the experience of worshiping in the physical presence of other Christ followers. So that it is by, part of what we would be doing is that using the media social platform, which is tied in and integrated with Facebook, we will go to a church if they choose to use our platform to put their services online and train worship hosts within that church who are embedded in the children's ministry, youth ministry, disability ministry. Those folks then are able to make online connections and follow up later in the week on prayer requests. They can use Facebook, they can use email as a way of making a connection with those families and through having that initial connection, they can build upon a relationship that starts initially online to be able to develop the influence to help that family then overcome whatever barriers or impediments or obstacles they might experience to being able to do church in the presence of their other Christ followers. 
Very cool. And, and can you share a link or where people can go to, to see this and, and, and um, experience it for themselves? www.keyministry.tv is our online platform. Um, we have two different churches. Um, your church is graciously signed on at CBC. Um, and First Christian Church in Canton are online now. So we have seven worship services a week. But we have other worship content available at different times during the day. We also have educational videos for church staff and parents, um, education and training for folks who are looking to include kids with these kinds of disabilities at church. And we have started running podcasts that are generated by our partners and our friends at Insight for Living, their special needs ministry, specifically around issues of disability inclusion in the church. So that by um, the 1st of March, we should be broadcasting roughly 15 hours a day, seven days a week, online church services, but also other content that would be of interest to families impacted by disability. That's awesome. We're, we're, we're going to come back and we're going to talk. I want to, I want to hear about two things when we come back. I want to hear about how, how specifically churches can use social media uh, and, and how they can partner with you in using social media to, to reach families. And then I also want to talk a little bit about more about uh, kids and ADHD and social media and how that works because I've often heard that it's making it worse for these kids with ADHD and and really uh, taking their their disability to another level in a negative way. So I want to hear your expert opinion on that. Uh, but I do want to uh, highlight our sponsor for this episode, Faith Social. Faith Social is the social engagement platform for churches that changes the way churches of all sizes communicate with their members and empowering them to share their faith through social media. Uh, check out faith social at faithsocial.com to learn more. So Steve, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, social media uh, and disability in churches. But first, can you share a little bit about your thoughts on how social media, and you talked about it a little bit, but is it making it worse for kids with ADHD and maybe other similar disabilities? Or do you see it as, as a really a healthy opportunity for them to engage and interact in relationships? Well, I think part of the challenge in looking at the research that's out there is that the findings on this are decidedly mixed. Um, That there have been some studies that have suggested that kids who are heavily engaged for hours at a time in social media may be more prone to having certain sorts of problems with attention and concentration. But one of the things that I see quite often in clinical practice is that you know, parents come in and complain about the amount of time that their kids are spending, um, you know, gaming, you know, playing, you know, Xbox Live or doing these things online with friends. With a lot of the kids that I see who struggle with, like, anxiety problems or learning problems, part of what they're doing is that they're using it as an escape in that a lot of these kids are kids who are struggling all day long in school anyway. If you think about it, You know, if you spend seven hours a day in a school environment where you don't feel very self-confident and you're struggling, who wants to come home and be reminded for two or three hours a night of the very stuff that frustrates you all day long? And, you know, that's a challenge that a lot of our families um, struggle with. And so that the confounding variable in looking at these studies is that the ability for kids to be able to seek out instantly on the internet, um, subject matter, video content, um, other content that they find engaging and interesting is something that they may be uniquely drawn to by the way that, you know, their brains were wired by God from the time that they were born. So that um, the data in terms of whether it's causing a problem may be a little more equivocal at this point in time, but I do think it's pretty clear that folks who have attention issues um, are in fact attracted to a lot of the rich content that's available through social media now. Um, You know, YouTube, Instagram in particular is very popular among a lot of the kids that we see. They're less likely to be involved with Facebook because they see that as something for their parents to share family pictures and, you know, not something that is as appealing to their generation. It's, so it's more, you know, the Instagram, the Vine, and the texting with the kids that we would see. But um, again, I think it's the content that draws kids who are wired a certain way 
um, you know, to the internet and to social media, as opposed to that necessarily creating a great deal more attention problems for them. Interesting. Interesting. Well, let, let's shift to the church. What, what advice would you give to church leaders with both your expertise now in social media and when it comes to, to families impacted by disability, what advice would, would you give to church leaders and how they can better utilize social media to minister to those families? Okay. I, I guess my first piece of advice is like Nike says, just do it. That um, part of, you know, you know, when you think back to like, you know, the first century church, you know, Jesus and the apostles, they were where the people were and the people are online now. And one area in particular that we have had extraordinary growth is being able to share a lot of our written content through Facebook. So that um, over the last couple of years, we have probably experienced since we started doing some targeted advertising on Facebook, at least tenfold growth in the number of folks accessing our blogs and so we had over 75,000 unique visitors to our ministry blog in just January of this year alone, which is, you know, it's a statistic that blows me away that there are enough people interested in something as um, narrow as what we're doing that we're getting 2,500 folks a day visiting, searching out content. And Facebook has been very helpful for us in terms of um, drawing people to written content and to print content, um, we don't do nearly as well from a return on investment standpoint when we try to use that to promote, say, our online church services, or if we were to post short videos, say, like on our Facebook page. So that um, with your help, you had introduced us to Jen Miles, and, you know, Jen used to be with Life Church. And we had gone about the process of procuring a Google grant, which is something I would also recommend that an individual church look to do if they're wanting to establish an online presence. So that we have $10,000 a month in free advertising available to us to be able to promote our resources to the disability community. And, you know, while we're still very early in the process, um, what Jen is doing working together with us is to try and figure out what the right target words and what the right ad words are that will appeal to the broadest range of the community that we're looking to seek at the smallest possible cost. So that I think that for the church, it's outwardly focused and looking to serve pursuing a Google grant, you know, is a complete no brainer. Um, a big part of what we're looking to do this year and something that worked extraordinarily well is that um, we are going to be looking to help churches set up online groups because one of the struggles that a lot of the families have that we serve is that um, even if a church has a disability ministry or special needs ministry, and maybe they can get there on Sunday um, because childcare is a significant problem during the week. A lot of these parents are very fatigued and worn out. Um, being part of a small group where on a weekly basis or every other week they get a chance to experience Christian community um, is oftentimes out of the question. And this had started with a request from some people from our home church, but we took this online and we did a pilot using um, a technology Zoom that we're actually using to film this conference today. Um, started... Um, started a small group for parents who were struggling with kids with disabilities. And we had eight families from six different states complete a seven week curriculum. And now the original group leader has trained up leaders from within that group and that they're continuing to meet on a weekly basis online using the video conferencing technology to experience Christian community. That's awesome. So I certainly think that that would be something that, Given, you know, and not just families with disability, but just, you know, I know that, you know, as a parent of teenagers, once our kids got to reach a certain age, it basically became impossible for our small group to find a time to meet because of the different, you know, transport schedules, sports schedules, parents travel right. schedules, that I think that online groups may be a great way for local churches, you know, regardless of whether or not the family has disability 
to be able to keep members engaged and to be able to enjoy Christian community, despite the very busy pace of life that we all find ourselves dealing with nowadays. Yeah, you know, we're, and we're using, uh, I love those recommendations. We're using a Zoom as well at Community Bible Church for our online groups more and more. We use Facebook groups. It's free, you know, uh, to connect uh, on a 24-7 basis. And then uh, Zoom, though, for the personalization, of, and people don't realize how easy it really is. We pay 10 bucks a month um, and, and really get, I mean, you can get 30 people, I, I believe, on a call simultaneously. And it, and it works even with pretty low internet speed. Uh, surprisingly well where Skype, even with two people, will often glitch a ton and, and other technology. So I feel like the technology is really caught up for us to really personalize that, that online group experience um, and really appreciate it. I mean, the, I, I'm, I'm with you. Google Grants is, is a resource that I, I think every church needs to use. Uh, I'm going to put in the show notes a link to Jen Miles and her uh, consulting page because she's been an expert that has helped us at Community Bible Church, I know has helped you and, and the countless others in maximizing that, that resource that that's really is tremendous. Uh, Steve, if you could share, how, how can people get a hold of you? How can they connect with you? And how can they find out more about Key Ministry? Well, if you're interested in connecting with me, it's real easy. It's Steve at Key Ministry, K-E-Y-M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y dot org. Um, um, our, that's our website, www.keyministry.org. Um, the blog that is being very heavily used is um, www.church4everychild.org. So Church for Every Child is the name of the blog. Um, we're on Facebook. And again, for our online training and our online church platform, it's just keyministry.tv. Great. You know, and I, and I meant to highlight too, I love uh, that you're seeing such a great success from long form written content because you're seeing uh, everyone saying, go video, go pictures, go images, uh, and keep text short. Now, now I'm seeing more and more, even from, uh, I read a lot of sports blogs, uh, more and more of those things are showing up in my Facebook feed. And so uh, I don't know if this is a growing trend or not, but you're obviously seeing great success in other churches and ministries can as well. When you, when you have great content, um, I think that's the key, you know, whether it's a video, whether it's a picture, whether it's a long form written content, if you have good content, people are going to share it. Facebook is going to show it. Uh, and you're going to build an audience. Unbelievable. The traffic, I, I do a lot of analytics on different websites. Uh, what you're seeing is tremendous. And I think it speaks to the need uh, that we have in the church today. Steve, I appreciate you so much. You taking the time to join us. Well, Nils, thanks so much for having me, and I hope that this is a blessing to others. Very good. Well, th thank you, everybody, for listening to this special edition of the Social Media Church Podcast. Visit socialmedia.church for the show notes, with all the information about this episode, and to hear other episodes from the Social Media Church.